My father died of cancer. My stepfather died of heart disease. My mother has severe osteoporosis. My sister-in-law is diabetic. A friend of mine was just diagnosed with breast cancer. My neighbors on heart medicines and cholesterol lowering drugs. All this sound familiar? What's not so familiar is that these health problems were caused by eating habits. In fact, eating is the biggest cause of disease, disabilities, and death in the U.S. today. And according to the Surgeon General, eating kills two out of three Americans every year. The American eating habit, in other words, is officially suicidal. For most of my life, I never made the connection. I was your typical American yuppie eating what I thought was a healthy diet. But that's just the problem. What we call a healthy diet, in fact what the government defines as a healthy diet, is health dangerous. People are dying of heart attacks, cancers, and other diseases because they're following these healthy guidelines. I remember the widow of a famous man saying she did everything right. She followed all the guidelines until she died of cancer in her early 60s. Later on, you'll meet Dr. Joseph Crow, a surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic who suffered a heart attack at the age of 44. And he completely reversed his heart disease by not following government guidelines. And you'll also meet Dr. Neil Pinckney, a psychologist who ate the standard American diet until his coronary arteries became blocked. Instead of bypass surgery, he reversed his heart disease by rejecting the advice of four doctors. And you'll meet Dr. Ruth Heydrich, a marathon runner who ate much better than government guidelines. She got breast cancer in her 40s as a result, and she beat the cancer only by waking up and not following the advice of five doctors. We assume we know more about health and nutrition now than we did back in the 1800s. Yet people living back then did not die because of what they ate. Before 1900, heart disease, our biggest killer, wasn't even included in medical textbooks. And cancer, diabetes, arthritis, and our other major diseases were rare and confined to the wealthy, who ate like most Americans eat today. People back then did not die of our current diseases because their eating habits were very different. Bread, potatoes, corn, oats, rye, barley meals, beans, and other vegetables, fruits, and whole grains were the major foods in their diets. Meat, dairy products, eggs, and fish were uncommon on the plates of working class Americans. It's not that they didn't want these foods, they simply could not afford them. But during the 20th century, everything changed. As animal foods became more affordable, Americans switched from their plant-based diets to animal-based diets. This triggered the biggest dietary change in human history and ushered in a new era of eating-related diseases. By the middle of the century, Americans were suddenly dying of heart attacks, and cancer had all the earmarks of an epidemic in the making. In the last half of the century, we doubled our meat consumption, until the average American was eating more meat than they weighed, 225 pounds of meat every year. And while we were gorging ourselves on meat, our consumption of plant foods was reduced to iceberg lettuce, greasy french fries, and ketchup. And over half our calories came from refined foods containing artery-clogging fats. By the year 2000, the American diet had been turned completely upside down. As a result, heart disease rose from an obscure illness to become our number one killer cancer, diabetes, and other little-known diseases became household names, we became the fattest nation on the planet, and we turned eating into the most popular form of unassisted suicide. 
Today, the majority of school children already have signs of heart disease, and many are now taking cholesterol-lowering drugs. And 85% of adults suffer from hardening of the arteries, and half of the entire population will die prematurely due to heart disease. And over 40% of the population will develop a life-threatening cancer. We've become a nation of walking wounded because of our diet. What Americans consider to be a healthy diet today is like a train wreck to the body. By age 65, we stuff over 50 tons of food down our throats, enough to fill six of these garbage trucks. In those quantities, the type of food you eat can devastate your body. Take a look at this staggering list of just some of the health disorders and diseases that are linked to our current eating habit. Americans are not unique. When people in other parts of the world abandon their traditional plant-based diets and start eating like Americans, they start dying like Americans. The pattern is not only obvious, but totally predictable. No matter where you look, when people adopt animal-based diets, heart disease and cancer suddenly become their biggest killers. This is now happening throughout the world in countries like Japan and China, where they're replacing rice and vegetables with meat and dairy products, and American eating diseases are spreading like wildfire. The one thing an animal-based diet does best is kill people. It does this by clogging arteries and restricting the flow of blood and oxygen throughout the body. Deprive the heart of oxygen, you get a heart attack. Deprive the brain of oxygen, you get a stroke. Deprive your tissues and cells of oxygen, and you set up the underlying cause of all cancers. Eating animal foods causes a fatty sludge buildup in your blood, and some of it sticks to the sides of your arteries. Your blood should be as clean and clear as the wine in this glass. When you eat a high-fat meal, it creates a fatty sludge buildup in your blood and causes your body to spend the next five hours cleaning up the mess. Of course, the excess fat and cholesterol eventually settles, usually in your arteries. This picture shows how fat and cholesterol build up in the arteries and restrict the flow of blood. The blue circle shows how wide the artery should be and the red circle shows how narrow it has become. Now imagine blood vessels throughout your entire body clogging up like this. The vast majority of our major diseases today, ranging from heart disease to spinal disc deterioration to senility, are ultimately the result of clogged arteries. In other words, clogged arteries go far beyond heart disease and almost all Americans have heart disease throughout their entire bodies. The seriousness of clogged blood vessels can't be exaggerated. More people die from blood vessel diseases than from all other causes of death combined. The primary cause of clogged blood vessels is cholesterol, and the only dietary source of cholesterol on the planet is animal foods. Animal foods close arteries. Plant foods open them. This is why our switch from a plant-based diet to an animal-based diet has been the biggest health disaster in human history. 
In fact, it's been estimated that cholesterol has contributed to more deaths than all the wars of the 20th century, all natural disasters, and all automobile accidents combined. Human bodies simply cannot handle cholesterol. It's the Achilles heel and fatal weakness of an animal-based diet. Movies and history books glorify man slaying animals and make it seem like eating meat was a daily event, but eating animals was extremely rare. In fact, ancient man was more the hunted than the hunter. Since the beginning, some five million years ago, humans have been, for all practical purposes, plant-eating vegetarians, living on fruits, leaves, nuts, berries, and other plant foods. Ancient humans ate over 800 varieties of fruits and vegetables. We can eat an unlimited amount of plant foods with health-enhancing effects, but we can only eat a tiny amount of animal foods before our arteries start to get clogged. Cholesterol has been called the animal's revenge because the animals you eat leave a little bit of themselves behind in your arteries every time you eat them and they'll kill you from their graves. Our liver produces all the cholesterol we'll ever need on its own and the requirement for cholesterol in our diet is exactly zero. Just ask Dr. Joseph Crow, a doctor at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. Dr. Crow had no family history of heart disease. He was fit, did not smoke, and had a total cholesterol of just 156 when he suddenly experienced a heart attack at the age of 44. In fact, I was, I was about as close as you can get to, to, you know, to not seeing tomorrow, so to speak. My diet was, I would say, uh, pretty much a standard, uh, you know, American diet. We, uh, we would eat uh, chicken, fish, and we would eat, uh, you know, beef, I, I, but I wouldn't say every day. Instead of dangerous surgery, Dr. Esselstyn, a colleague at the Cleveland Clinic and one of the world's leading authorities in heart disease reversal, told him to simply change his diet. Just a few months after changing his diet, Dr. Crow's cholesterol went from 156 to 89 without any medication. Uh, you know, it was a big change for the, uh, in the diet, and uh, it was reflected in my, uh, in my blood work. Uh, and I was just following the diet, and I was exercising. I mean, I wasn't doing anything else, and I didn't take any medication. The, uh, I, the whole set, my total cholesterol had been under 100. Um, without any, uh, any medication since I started the diet. Dr. Crow's heart disease was completely reversed. This picture shows the diseased, shriveled artery on the left and his healed artery on the right. Dramatic proof of how a plant-based diet heals from within. Dr. Neil Pinckney knows something about clogged arteries. His father died of heart disease at the age of 59. At the age of 58, Dr. Pinckney almost met the same fate when he discovered that his main coronary artery was 100% blocked and the other two were 90 and 85% blocked. Uh, what I did was I thought I was doing all the healthy things. I gave up a lot of steak and roast and pork and ate chicken and fish instead. And I ate white meat chicken breast. Well, I didn't know that a white meat chicken breast had just about the same amount of cholesterol as a T-bone steak. I had no idea, and I was a cheeseaholic. Not only did it give me much more sodium than I needed, but it was giving me 60 or 70 percent of my calories from fat, when now I'm only at 10 percent of my calories of fat. It was cheese, and the other foods were plugging up my arteries, and sending me to the hospital. Uh, what one of the doctors said was very apt. He said, you've got one foot in the grave and the other on a banana peel. His cardiologist told him he needed emergency bypass surgery or he would die. He decided to save his own life by walking away from that surgery. And they said, well, you don't want this life-saving procedure? And I said, no, it's against my religion. 
And they all looked at me very quizzically and said, what is your religion? And I said, I'm a devout coward. So with that, uh, against their advice, I went home to learn about how I could repair the damage myself and do something on my own to reverse the heart disease, and I did. After leaving his surgeons behind, Dr. Pinckney began reading books on reversing heart disease and changing his diet. My angina, the pain that was so severe, within two weeks it was almost all gone. Within two months it was completely gone. And I started walking up. I couldn't walk 200 feet without severe pain and have to sit down. And just three months later, I was walking two miles up a steep hill with no pain. Seven months after I started this program, I finished in the middle of the pack of an 8.2 mile Great Aloha Run, and I had never run a race before in my life. The chief of cardiology was so amazed, he couldn't believe it, that he started sending his patients to my support groups instead of to bypass surgery. 99% of the people who are scheduled for bypasses shouldn't have to have them as long as they're willing to make changes in their lifestyle. That seems to be much more sensible than having a stent put in, which will close up again if you don't change your lifestyle, or a bypass operation, which will plug up again if some, eventually, maybe in a year, maybe in five years, but it's going to plug up again unless the lifestyle has changed. Dr. Esselstyn is one of the world's leading experts at treating heart disease. He says heart disease can be stopped in its tracks and reversed by adopting a simple plant-based diet. He should know. He's conducted the longest and most successful heart disease reversal program ever. Well, the American Heart Association uh, is recommending presently that you keep maintaining a cholesterol uh, under 200 and the dietary fat in here would be less than 30%. But if you look at people who are consuming uh, a fat level of 30%, not only have we never seen regression of disease at that level, but indeed there are studies that indicate there is progression of disease at that level. So literally, if you follow the guidelines of the American Heart Association Step 1 diet, that literally guarantees that millions of Americans will continue to perish from this what happens when our nutrient support comes from foods that not in a decade, or not in two decades, or not in three decades, but eventually will cause us to be ravaged by these disease conditions that really occupy about 70% of, uh, of medical therapy that we see today. We know now, from data that we have, that through a, the so-called brachial artery tourniquet test that with a single needle you can demonstrate the endothelial injury that occurs to the vascular system. And that's the, the problem with today with the most uh, well-intentioned internists and cardiologists that you're only having roast beef uh, uh, once or twice a week now, no longer regularly, you're only occasionally having chicken, you're eating less cheese, you're eating less cream, you're eating less butter. and. Uh, as a result, instead of pouring gallons of gasoline on the fire, you're pouring parts of gasoline on the fire. And as a result, the fire doesn't go out. This is in tremendously empowering for the patient because the patient has become the locus of control, not the cardiologist, not the surgeon. And it's so reassuring to them to think that I am in charge of this disease that previously was trying to destroy me. Not only do you escape stroke and heart attack, but this also would include obesity, hypertension, adult onset diabetes, and uh, the common western cancers of breast in the female, prostate in the male, and colon in both. So I think the spin-offs here, in terms of overall health, are extremely profound. Mainstream medical authorities recommend a cholesterol level of under 200, yet one-third of all new heart attacks occur in people with cholesterol levels between 150 and 200. The only safe level is under 150, and health authorities know it. This was established years ago in the largest heart disease study ever undertaken. Mainstream medical authorities recommend a 30% fat diet, 
yet there is not one instance where such a diet has either arrested or reversed heart disease. In fact, that level of fat promotes heart disease. Why such a high fat recommendation? Because our esteemed health authorities readily accept money from food lobbies pushing high fat foods and that money shapes their recommendations. Health authorities who argue that a 30% fat diet is heart healthy do not have a single case of heart disease arrest or reversal to point to. Not a single solitary individual. And it shouldn't be for a lack of funding. Dr. Neil Pinckney accomplished his heart disease reversal and actually saved money on groceries. And it isn't just coincidence that individuals throughout the world eating low-fat diets do not get heart disease, nor do they get our common cancers. The biggest killer in America today is the result of high-fat diets the American government and mainstream authorities are promoting that are fueled by the money given to them by food lobbies pushing high-fat foods. Diet is the only cure for heart disease, yet it's lost in the news by drug companies developing ever more profitable drugs that do not cure the disease, but only serve to keep Americans on the very diet that causes heart disease. Man walked out of Africa just 150,000 years ago. That's the blink of an eye in terms of human evolution. In the mere span of just 100 years, we've become so accustomed to eating animal foods, we think it's the normal, natural, healthy way to eat. It isn't. We also think that dying of heart disease is a normal way of dying. It isn't. Dying of heart disease is about as normal as dying of a drug overdose, and it shouldn't happen at any age. Show me a population eating an animal-based diet, and I'll show you a population where cancer is the second biggest killer after heart disease. In fact, heart disease and cancer are the two hallmark diseases of an animal-based diet. In 1971, President Nixon declared a war on cancer and promised a cure for the disease within seven years. We all know that didn't happen. The war on cancer has not only been ineffective, but the search for a so-called cure has been totally misguided. Now close your blinds, turn down the volume, and make sure no one else is watching because I'm about to let you in on a dirty little secret. Ready? We already have a cure for cancer. It's called the immune system. Your immune system not only protects you against colds and flus, but it's been protecting humans from cancer since the very beginning. It's the only cure for cancer we have. Always has been and always will be. The biggest cause of cancer is not radiation, chemicals in the water or pollutants in the air, but a weakened immune system that cannot recognize and kill cancer cells. In other words, you can't prevent cancer. You're going to get cancer cells in your body. The average adult gets at least one cancer cell in their body every single day. And there's nothing you can do to prevent this from happening. The question is not whether you'll get cancer, but whether your immune system is healthy enough to kill cancer cells and stop them from multiplying. Autopsy studies have shown that by age 50, almost half of all women have breast cancer and 40% of men have prostate cancer. And nearly all Americans have some form of cancer growing inside their bodies. 
This is because our immune systems have become seriously weakened due to our change in diet. This is why populations eating animal-based diets are plagued with cancers, and those eating plant-based diets are not. Don't look to the cancer industry for a cure. The cure for cancer is right inside you, and the only way to win your personal war on cancer is to strengthen your immune system by changing your diet. Plant foods are the only foods that strengthen the immune system and contain cancer-fighting nutrients. So a change to a plant-based diet turns out to be the only real cure for cancer we have. The strongest cancer-fighting medicines on the planet don't have scary names, and they're not found in hospitals, but in your humble grocery store. The founder of the macrobiotic diet actually cured himself of cancer by adopting a 100% plant-based diet that strengthened his immune system. A surgeon developed breast cancer and her tumor grew to the size of a grapefruit. She rejected conventional treatments and completely cured her cancer by radically changing her diet and lifestyle. Another physician found out he had prostate cancer that had spread throughout his body. On the chance advice of two strangers, he adopted a 100% plant-based diet and reversed his cancer. There are thousands of cases where people have reversed serious cancers by changing to a strict plant-based diet. Cancer cells don't just fade away. The only thing that will defeat cancer is a strong immune system, and plant foods strengthen that immune system. Just ask Dr. Ruth Heydrich, who was diagnosed with breast cancer over 20 years ago, despite the fact she was eating better and exercising more back then than what government guidelines recommend today. It can't be cancer. I'm too healthy. I'm a marathoner, for God's sake. I can't have cancer. This lump is something else. I was horrified, mortified, felt betrayed by my body, thought this can't be happening. So even though I felt healthy, there was this insidious cancer that was growing inside me. I didn't know it for a long time. After her surgery, she was faced with the prospect of chemotherapy and radiation treatments to kill cancer cells that had spread throughout her body. When I was told that I needed chemotherapy and radiation, I was dreading it. I was thinking that that is, it was scary. I really did not want to have poison injected in my veins. And having worked for the military, I knew what radiation damage could do to a body. I did not want that. So I was looking for somebody, something, to tell me another way. I just maybe intuitively felt that there has to be another answer. She sought not just a second opinion, but five second opinions, until she found Dr. John McDougall, who said, in no uncertain terms, her breast cancer was caused by her diet. Before the, my dietary change, I ate what I call the SAD diet, the standard American diet. Well, I knew that it wasn't diet in my case, but let's prove it to the world. And I knew because I was not eating any red meat. I had only skim milk and chicken and fish. And so when I went to see Dr. McDougall, he said, that's the diet that caused your breast cancer. I was shocked. He said, if you want to save your life, change your diet. 
And of course my response was, let's see, let's prove it one way or the other. And then I thought, oh, it's too late. And he said, no, it's not too late because your immune system, you've had the surgery, you've removed that tumor. Now what your body has to do is kill off those stray cancer cells that have, without any doubt, already spread through your body. What your body now has to do is kind of a mop-up operation. And that's what diet enables that immune system to do. The major point, though, is that you search for the cause. Breast cancer is a symptom of a lousy diet. She refused chemotherapy and radiation treatments and switched to a 100% plant-based diet. 20 years later, she's cancer-free and credits her new diet with saving her life. Breast cancer thrives in an estrogen-rich environment, and women in America are literally swimming in estrogen with levels up to twice as high as women eating plant-based diets. Animal-based diets also cause girls to begin their menstrual cycles at a much younger age than girls eating plant-based diets. In just 140 years, the average age of puberty in U.S. girls has dropped from 17 to 12, and menopause starts four years later. In other words, an animal-based diet has added nine years of menstrual cycles to the lives of women. How do we know this is caused by diet? Because girls raised in the U.S. and throughout the world on plant-based diets reach their puberty at the normal age. Usually, parents take great pride as they see their children mature and they think, oh, my daughter's, we're getting graphic again, started her periods when she was 11 years old, and they think that this is good. Actually, it's, it's bad. It increases the risk of breast cancer, premature death, heart disease, all these other problems. We need to turn it around and try to delay the onset of puberty in our children. Men on animal-based diets also reach puberty earlier and have abnormally high levels of testosterone. And studies have linked high testosterone levels to prostate cancer. Men throughout the world eating traditional plant-based diets have normal testosterone levels and don't get prostate cancer. In 1993, the National Cancer Institute published the results of a study with women who had been treated for breast cancer. They told half the women to continue with their typical American diets and asked the other half to change to a plant-based diet. After only four years, almost 40% of the women who stayed on their animal-based diets had recurrences of breast cancer. Not a single woman who changed to a plant-based diet had a recurrence of breast cancer. The difference between the two groups? Animal-based diets feed cancers. Plant-based diets feed your immune system. Cancer just doesn't go away on its own, and it will return with a vengeance if your immune system can't fight it. When you look around the world, populations eating animal-based diets have skyrocketing rates of breast and other cancers, compared to those populations eating plant-based diets. When I was diagnosed back in 1982, the incidence of breast cancer in women was 1 in 14. A couple of years after that, it was 1 in 12. Then I watched it 1 in 10, 1 in 8 and it's still increasing in frequency. And if you look at this planet Earth, and again, the incidence of breast cancer all around, you find it is highest in those countries that eat the most animal foods, that have the highest fat consumption. And conversely, breast cancer is extremely rare in those countries that can't afford to eat animals. Plant-based diets also cure adult-onset diabetes, as well as many other diseases. 
The American Diabetes Association will tell you there is no cure for adult onset diabetes, which simply means there is no drug that will cure the disease. And yet, adult onset diabetes is easily and quickly cured with a change in diet and lifestyle. So I don't really believe there are any intelligent people in the scientific community that have any doubt that type 2 diabetes is caused by the rich Western diet. I think everybody agrees with that. But what they don't do is they don't take the next step, which is to say, okay, this is the cause of it, so what you ought to do is you ought to change your diet. They come in and get on this program, and in 24 hours, they have cut their insulin by half. On day number five or six, they don't need insulin at all, ever again. Now that, when you hear about it, I know sometimes you may hear things like this and you think, that's impossible, how could that be true? I, you know, the doctor says this is incurable, you can't reverse it. That's, it is not true. You can completely heal diabetes, and very, very quickly. In most cases, five to seven days. We have a few cases that are particularly severe, it might take two weeks. Uh, we find in five to seven days, someone with type 2 diabetes, if they eat a 100% uh, plant-based diet, they're no longer on insulin. I, I haven't seen that not happen. So yes, the emphasis uh, on treatment by the American Diabetic Association, by the American Heart Association, by the National Osteoporosis Foundation, and so on, they're all in the wrong direction. But they have a lot of big industry money that keeps them focused in that bad direction too. This didn't just happen by, by circumstance, by happenstance. This happened because there is uh, an active flow of money that keeps them in the direction of drugs and not in the direction of good diet. You don't have people coming with lupus and multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's and chronic fatigue syndrome and schizophrenia and obesity and diabetes and uh, arthritis and osteoporosis and on and on. People with multiple sclerosis. I mean, some of them have even gone blind from these things and we have reversed blindness from it. Uh, I've had people with MS that were debilitated. I mean, not to even be able to get up and walk on their own, completely healed. Parkinson's patients coming in on day one, shaking so dramatically that they couldn't even hold their hand out to shake it. By day 10, steady as a rock. Lupus. People come in wheelchairs sometimes. I mean, literally cannot raise their arm enough to feed themselves. And within 10 days, they're up and out of that wheelchair and walking. You know, AIDS and HIV. I've got so many testimonies now. I had one gentleman come. His viral load for AIDS was over 103,000 when he started my program. In three months, his viral load had dropped to 3,030. In nine months, they could not detect the virus in his body and his T cells had gone all the way back up. So we hear all the time that AIDS is incurable. Well, if it's incurable, then how is it disappearing from the body? If you're like many Americans, you might be thinking, but animal foods have nutrients I've been told I can't live without. Please enter the fantasy land of the animal food industries. In order to keep their profits healthy, some monumental myths have been cooked up about animal foods. If you worry about not getting enough protein, or if you think that milk builds strong bones, you've been brainwashed and your eating habits have been programmed by advertisements. Both protein and calcium requirements are stupendously easy to meet. In the case of protein, you could eat nothing but potatoes and get adequate amounts of protein. In other words, you'd practically have to be starving not to get enough protein. Protein deficiency is extremely rare, except in areas of the world where people actually are starving. It's really pathetic. We're the fattest nation on the planet, we eat like horses, and we worry about something that will only happen if we're starving. Instead of your first nutrition worry, protein should be your rock bottom last. And if you're worried that 
not eating animal protein will somehow compromise your health, make you weaker or less manly. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, it's just the opposite. Animal food actually makes you weaker. In every endurance test ever conducted, those eating plant-based diets outperform their meat-eating counterparts. In fact, when participants adopted a diet high in meat, milk, and eggs, they all performed worse. And Olympian Carl Lewis had the best year of his career, the first year he switched to a 100% plant-based diet. Lori Ann Lloyd fuels her body with a plant-based diet, and that has won her the world record in the obstacle course. And her record still stands unbeaten. A lot of people have been on the obstacle course, firemen, policemen. I do it because it's very challenging. Females are, I think they're more athletic than, than most people realize. You know, Lori, we call Lori the bionic woman. She's, she's not human. When you see what she does on this course, she's not human. She's not. For centuries, men have held on to the false notion that eating meat, especially red meat, will make them stronger and more masculine. But in fact, not only does it diminish their physical performance, but men end up far less virile because their arteries get clogged. And among many other things, clogged blood vessels cause impotence. Not too manly. High fat meals also cause fatigue and make you limp. Get your Viagra and vegetables, not a pill. The meat myth is simply a fairy tale. Get your protein without the fat and cholesterol. You'll not only open your arteries, but your love life as well. All the foods listed here will easily meet your protein and other manly requirements. The protein content of many plant foods is even higher than beef, and unlike beef, these foods will never clog up your plumbing. Calcium brainwashing is even worse than protein brainwashing in that you'll consume adequate amounts of calcium on any natural diet. In fact, calcium deficiency of a dietary origin is not only unknown in the United States, but there has not been a single recorded instance of calcium deficiency of a dietary origin in the entire history of the human race. Despite this fact, the dairy industry claims that Americans somehow have a calcium deficiency and, big surprise, we're told we have to consume more dairy products. But why would Americans be so special and have this calcium deficiency when populations around the world do not? And those populations consume a fraction of the calcium Americans do, they have no osteoporosis problem, and they get their calcium from plant foods not dairy products. The reason Americans are so special is because dairy lobbies have paid off politicians and set U.S. calcium requirements sky high in order to sell their products. In other words, the same people selling calcium are setting our calcium requirements. And dietitians, doctors, and the public have bought into this because the government promotes dairy products. In fact, the amount of calcium you consume has nothing to do with bone loss. We're among the world's biggest consumers of calcium, and the more we consume, the more calcium ends up in the toilet, and the greater our incidence of osteoporosis. To think the mere act of consuming more calcium, like taking a magic pill, will somehow make bones strong is pure and simple advertising. The primary cause of osteoporosis is a lack of weight-bearing activity due to a sedentary work and lifestyle. An example of how a lack of weight-bearing activity affects bone loss comes from astronauts because they experience severe bone loss due to their gravity-free environment. 
In a similar fashion, people who are bedridden for long periods also suffer rapid bone loss. Bones are just like muscles. They get stronger and grow only when you put them under stress, just as muscles get stronger when you exercise them. Bone is just like muscle. If you want to build a real bicep, you know what you have to do? Most people know that you can't just pop a protein pill and that it goes right to the muscle and builds it up. You have to really stress it. You have to put a lot of weight on it. Right underneath that muscle, we got a bone. The bone is more metabolically active than that muscle. When that bone is being stressed, or if you're lifting weights like this, the bone is saying, whoa, wait a minute, we, we're not prepared for this. We better lay down some stronger bone, and that's what happens. In the past, we used to get paid for physical activity. Now we get paid for sitting in chairs all day. In the past, American women have had far less physical activity than men, and this is the primary reason osteoporosis strikes women harder than men. Physical activity is also the reason why women throughout the world who consume very low amounts of calcium keep their strong bones during and after menopause. Contrary to what you've been told, bone loss does not occur with age. It occurs when people become less active. You'll get enough calcium on any diet. Let your body determine the amount of calcium it needs, not the dairy industry. What you have to do is make your bones want to be stronger by exercising them. If they don't feel that need, like the bones of astronauts in space, they'll become weaker. Sharing heart disease among family and friends is part of the American way of life. And to suggest you not share diseases with your loved ones is downright un-American. Many people have taken to sharing the so-called lighter meats, like chicken, turkey, pork, and fish, thinking this will somehow prevent bad things from happening to their family and friends. If your doctor told you eating lighter meats will lower your cholesterol, you're just playing with your food. What's the difference between white meat and red meat, in your opinion? It's a question of whether you want to be shot or hung. <laughs> if you get a three ounce piece of steak, you get 75 milligrams of cholesterol. If you get a three ounce serving of white meat, skinless chicken, you get 72 grams of milligrams of cholesterol. I mean, basically it's pretty much the same. Health authorities like to talk about reducing risks by eating lighter meat, but reducing the risk of a heart attack isn't preventing one. The only way you're going to prevent a heart attack is to get your cholesterol below 150. And eating lighter meats won't get you there. So what about that good fat in fish? Well, that good fat originally came from plants, the plants eaten by fish. So you're not only getting the good fat secondhand, but you're getting it in a package of bad fat, cholesterol, PCBs, pesticides, and other poisons. And calorie for calorie, shrimp have six times the amount of cholesterol as beef. To say eating fish is healthy because it contains a little good fat is like saying Twinkies is healthy because it contains a little calcium. And what about those dairy products? Dairy, in fact, has been called liquid meat because it contains just as much fat and cholesterol as red meat. Drinking three glasses of milk a day as the dairy industry and our government recommends gives you the same amount of artery-clogging cholesterol as eating 21 slices of bacon. A pint of ice cream is worth 24 slices of bacon. And at least one protein in dairy may trigger the onset of insulin-dependent diabetes in children. At least one hormone in dairy has been strongly linked to breast and prostate cancer. 
Over 50% of school children are allergic to dairy, and 70% of the population is lactose intolerant, particularly people of color. And due to the strong dairy lobby in Washington, this fat and cholesterol-laden food is required eating for all children enrolled in federal lunch programs, which also amounts to nutritional persecution of minorities due to their high rates of lactose intolerance. And yet, most doctors and dietitians still recommend milk every day. The next time you give your child milk and cookies, imagine giving them meat and cookies because that's exactly what they're getting. We live in a strange world when it comes to eating. Don't you think it's strange that one-third of our raw materials and fossil fuels are consumed raising animals to eat? Don't you think it's strange that with the fuel used to create just a single hamburger, you could drive a car 20 miles? Don't you think it's strange that it's actually cheaper to drive a car any distance than to walk that same distance if your calories came from beef. Don't you think it's strange that hamburger, one of the most resource intensive and expensive foods on the planet, costs less than raspberries? Ever wonder how it's possible that fast food chains can still sell a hamburger for 99 cents? It's possible because of politics because our politicians provide massive subsidies to the animal food industries in return for political campaign financing. And without these subsidies, the cost of animal foods would be like it was in the past, and only the wealthy would be eating themselves to death. Because beef steak today would cost over $90 a pound without these subsidies. You may think you're calling the shots when you're preparing meals, but there's a politician in your kitchen, and he's already decided what you'll be eating tonight. In fact, the most health dangerous eating habit in human history is purely the result of government interference in the marketplace. Not only do animal food industries get subsidies to keep them in business, but they get a determining influence on our nutrition policies as well. The animal food lobbies have had their claws into everything from designing the government food pyramid to staffing government bureaucracies to setting our nutritional standards. And having these industries on government committees that decide what's healthy for Americans is like having Joe Camel on a committee designed to help people quit smoking. This is why so many Americans do everything right, yet die from following government guidelines. Food industries spend $30 billion a year marketing their products. The marketing effort to promote natural whole foods is a mere $30 million a year. In other words, we spend over $100 per person each year promoting foods that cause disease and shorten lives and only a dime promoting foods that prevent disease and prolong lives. The average consumer doesn't have a chance. Between government endorsement of animal products and heavy advertising, the typical American eats like a trained seal. And the training starts early. The average child is exposed to over 10,000 food messages on television every year and our eating habits are an exact reflection of marketing efforts. Sad as this may sound, the best thing you can do for your child's health is to turn off the television. Not too long ago, Americans thought there was nothing wrong with smoking. Doctors smoked and even recommended cigarettes to their patients. Cool Cigarettes ran ads that their product actually prevented colds. 
and the media was filled with health claims for cigarettes. The tobacco industries used doctors to prove their case, and they used health claims in their slogans. As late as 1950, the American medical community still did not think smoking was a factor in lung cancer. And the American Medical Association had a cozy financial relationship with the tobacco industry. And to this day, tobacco executives deny that nicotine is addictive and claim that smoking does not cause lung cancer or any other disease. Today, we have the same attitude about animal foods. Like the tobacco industry, the animal food industries have all had advertisements taken off under court order because they were caught lying. And like tobacco executives, meat, dairy, and egg executives will swear that animal foods have nothing to do with heart disease, cancer, or any other disease, despite the medical evidence to the contrary. What smoking does for your lungs, cholesterol does for your arteries, and the damage is even more lethal. What the animal food industries are doing for American health today is precisely what the tobacco industry did for our health just a few decades ago, only worse. By subsidizing the animal food industries, the government promotes an eating habit that's the biggest killer in America today. Like the tobacco industry, animal food industries publish phony studies, deny there are any risks involved in eating their products, and fight tooth and nail for every subsidy they can get. Like the tobacco industry, the animal food industries collect billions in subsidies and pocket billions in profits, and the public gets stiffed with higher taxes, disease, disabilities, and premature death and we pay billions more for health care to treat problems caused by the foods these industries and the government promote. When I first changed to a plant-based diet, I switched overnight, and my diet evolved as I learned more about food. I can't imagine myself ever eating any other way. It's the most delicious and varied diet I can conceive of. And those who think otherwise simply haven't tried it. It's not like you have to eat Brussels sprouts all day. This is really an old fashioned diet. All you have to do is reorient your thinking about food. We're all attached to our favorite animal foods and it's difficult to give them up. So if you're unprepared for a complete switch, do the best you can by gradually replacing foods in your diet. Eat the old fashioned way by making animal foods only a very occasional part of your diet until you feel comfortable making a complete switch. It's actually a lot easier than you think. Your diet can evolve, but keep pushing it. The closer you move to a complete plant-based diet, the greater the health benefits. When you follow a whole foods plant-based diet, you'll notice several things immediately. First, you'll discover you were constipated and didn't even know it. Your bowel movements will be easier and more frequent. Be happy. Your body's getting rid of toxic substances on a regular basis. The second thing you'll notice, if you have it checked, is a drop in cholesterol. Well, the first time I'm in Dr. McDougall's office, he had said, bring your medical records with you. He's looking through everything, and he said, hmm, hmm. I said, what, what? He said, your cholesterol is high, 236. You know, at that level, you are at as great a risk of having a heart attack and dying of heart disease as you are the breast cancer. Dr. McDougall said, change your diet, and it'll take care of the cholesterol as well. Three weeks later, exactly 21 days later, Back in his office, blood test, cholesterol, 160. 236, 160 in three weeks. No medication, no nothing. Just quit eating the stuff and it goes away. My own cholesterol went from 372, it's now 124. 
The third thing you'll notice is weight loss. What you won't notice immediately are the changes going on inside you. The clearing of fat and cholesterol from your blood vessels, the freer oxygen flow to all parts of your body, the strengthening of your immune system, and many other changes that will make you healthier and happy you adopted a new way of eating. And the changes this diet can make to your health by just opening up your blood vessels can be profound in many different ways. Long before our food revolution, Thomas Edison wrote, the doctor of the future will give no medicine but will involve the patient in the proper use of food, fresh air, and exercise. If you ask your doctors what you should be eating to fight arthritis, menstrual cramps, or cancer, they won't have a clue. But they will know what drugs to prescribe. But drugs only treat symptoms. Cholesterol-lowering drugs treat a symptom of a bad eating habit. Treating the cause of high cholesterol means eliminating cholesterol from your diet. The most often heard phrase in the cancer industry is early detection. But that's early detection of a symptom. The real cause of cancer is a weakened immune system that's weakened by the foods we eat. Tragically, the bulk of our vast medical establishment is dedicated to treating symptoms, not causes. And symptoms of diseases that were not even common before 1900. The mutilating surgeries, the billions of dollars spent on drugs, are for the most part treating symptoms of a lousy diet. You might be asking, why doesn't my doctor know about the powerful effects of diet? Simply put, they haven't been trained in plant-based nutrition. Uh, we are not educated, uh, we are not trained, and we are not in any way supported to uh, work with our patient population in terms of education, uh, disease prevention, uh, and, uh, and, and wellness. Uh, we are uh, uh, we are trained to focus on um, uh, fixing the problem after it, uh, after it occurs, uh, not preventing the problem. And that's true of all of uh, medicine uh, these days. Before you make a life-altering decision, get the advice of doctors who are trained in plant-based nutrition, who are completely reversing diseases by simple changes in diet and avoiding the use of drugs and surgery. Read the books listed at the end, and the next time you visit your doctor, don't be afraid to question his or her advice or seek second opinions. After all, it wasn't that long ago that doctors were advising pregnant women to smoke. The human body is a miracle, and it's constantly trying to heal itself from the wounds inflicted on it by an animal-based eating habit. In fact, the whole point of the RAVE diet is to go back to the fundamental foods our bodies evolved with in order to give our bodies a chance to heal themselves. Because the best doctor on the planet is still right inside all of us. Raising animals to eat is the most inefficient, wasteful, and environmentally destructive method of producing food imaginable. This may surprise you, but we grow far more food to feed the animals we eat than we grow to feed ourselves. Farm animals consume 80% of American corn, 80% of American grain, and over 95% of American oats. 87% of our total agricultural land is dedicated to raising the animals we eat. That's almost half of the entire landmass in the U.S. 
almost 90% of deforestation is due to our appetite for beef. To date, over 260 million acres of forest have been destroyed to provide cattle with grazing land, and another acre disappears every eight seconds. The primary reason the Amazon forest is being destroyed is not to harvest wood or provide more room for a growing population, but to provide grazing fields and land to grow crops that are then exported to feed livestock throughout the world. Not only does Brazil export most of its crops, but the U.S. exports crops as well, with two-thirds of the U.S. grain harvest going to feed cattle in other countries. So cheap meat can then be imported back into the U.S., and fast food chains can save a nickel on every burger. For every burger imported into the U.S., 67 square feet of rainforest is cleared. Every second, another acre is gone. Every second, our diet is shrinking the lungs of the world. Today, most of the crops in the world are now grown to feed meat and dairy livestock. Tragically, there is plenty of food for the animals we eat, but not enough for the millions of starving people throughout the world. When we clear forests to raise animals, the carbon dioxide stored in trees is released into the atmosphere. And these forest clearing fires represent a whopping 20% of all greenhouse gases. Our appetite for meat, in other words, is a major factor in global warming. One of the biggest challenges facing the future of modern civilization is global warming. And our diet plays a huge role in warming up the planet. Raising hundreds of millions of animals around the world generates more greenhouse gases than all the cars, trucks, planes, and ships in the world combined. The production of just two pounds of beef creates the same amount of carbon dioxide as going for a joyride for three hours, while leaving all the lights in your home blazing. The consequences of our eating habit are so staggering that if everyone laid off meat just one day a week, it would have the same effect as taking eight million cars off American roads. Eating meat is more significant than most realize because not all greenhouse gases are created equal. While everyone focuses on carbon dioxide, this gas is not responsible for most of the Earth's warming. Other gases trap heat far more powerfully than carbon dioxide, and the most important of these is methane. Methane is over 20 times more powerful in trapping heat than carbon dioxide. In fact, methane emissions are responsible for nearly half of the planet's human-induced warming. The number one source of methane? Raising animals for food. Global meat consumption has skyrocketed in the last 50 years, and current consumption is expected to double in the next 50 years, which means our meat-eating habit will be catastrophic for future generations. The good news? Unlike carbon dioxide, which can stay in the atmosphere for more than a century, methane cycles out of the atmosphere in just eight years. In other words, by changing your diet, you can have an immediate impact on the cooling of the Earth at every single meal. 
This is perhaps an embarrassing truth that Al Gore failed to mention in his famous documentary. Embarrassing because his family has always raised Angus beef, one of the biggest methane emitters in the world. Here are his top recommendations. All of these are necessary, but he, like others, have missed the 800-pound gorilla sitting in the room. Not a single mention of the cause of nearly half of our global warming. Hard as this may be to swallow, putting the wrong type of food into your mouth is one of the most significant causes of global warming. And the single most effective thing you can do to help stop global warming is to change your diet. Our diet impacts the environment in many other ways. The massive amount of crops grown to feed livestock and water pastures consumes over half of the fresh water supply in the U.S. It takes 12,000 gallons of fresh water to produce just one pound of beef versus 60 gallons to produce a pound of potatoes. Twelve miles of the San Joaquin River in California are now completely dry because water has been diverted to grow crops for farm animals. In some areas, so much water has been diverted from hydroelectric dams that nuclear power plants have had to be constructed to make up for the loss of power. The average American uses just 106 gallons of water a day for domestic needs. But if they eat a quarter pound hamburger, their daily consumption of water jumps by 3,000 gallons. In the year 2000, the average American consumed 69 pounds of beef and a total of 225 pounds of meat. By giving up meat, you'd be saving over a million gallons of fresh water every year. If you added to the price of beef just the water subsidies alone, hamburger would cost $35 a pound. Instead of tinkering with your toilets and shower heads, reducing meat consumption is the best way to conserve our fresh water supplies. Our diet is not only using huge amounts of water, but it's actually depleting our fresh water supplies. The largest source of fresh water in the world will be completely dry in less than 50 years. And once it dries up, the breadbasket of the U.S. will turn into a dustbin. That's the legacy our diet will leave to our children. Eating animals not only consumes half our water, but their excrement pollutes the other half. In fact, farm animals produce 130 times more waste than people do. And yet, not one feedlot or farm in America is required to have a proper sewage system. It's become so bad that animal waste flowing down the Mississippi River has made an area the size of New Jersey totally uninhabitable to marine life. It's called the dead zone. E. coli, salmonella, listeria, and all the other fancy scientific names used to describe food pathogens all boil down to the same thing for the consumer. There's animal excrement in your food. It's become so bad that E. coli is now the leading cause of kidney failure among American children. Modern meat is so burdened with animal waste, you could actually clean it in your toilet. It's safer eating a carrot anywhere but in your kitchen, if meat has been there. Packaged meat now carries a warning label telling consumers to wash everything that's even come into contact with meat. The reason you have to cook it so long is to make sure the animal excrement is safe for you to eat. It's no longer a question of whether there's manure in your meat. 
It's a question of how to deal with it. The meat industry's answer is not to get rid of it, but to nuke the whole package with radiation. Now, all you have to worry about is getting used to the taste of a mouthful of dead bacteria from fried farm animal feces. We're also depleting our oceans of marine life and setting in motion a trend that some say will result in the whole-scale collapse of marine ecosystems within 40 years. Using sophisticated technology to sweep the oceans with massive nets, we're now taking more fish out of the ocean than can reproduce and wreaking havoc on the very foundation of life on Earth. The irony is that farm animals eat far more fish than people do. In fact, half of the world's fish catch is fed to livestock. As it turns out, the best first step you can take to help save the oceans is to stop eating farm animals. We're also losing our biological diversity because of our appetite for beef. For decades, the U.S. government had a program designed to totally exterminate wolves in order to protect cattle. Currently, the U.S. government slaughters one and a half million animals every year to protect cattle. This is yet another government subsidy that benefits a few large corporations. These are just some of the victims. Our farm animals are neither happy nor healthy. In fact, they're tortured, disease-ridden, drugged up, cancer-carrying shadows of the old-fashioned farm animals your great-grandparents ate. Modern farms view animals as machines which can be manipulated to produce more offspring, lay more eggs, produce more milk, and grow faster and fatter than ever before. Farm animals are genetically altered and systematically mutilated to squeeze the last penny from them before they end up on your plates. The picture is not pretty. In fact, the modern farm is more like a concentration camp for animals. The American eating habit is supporting a system of animal cruelty on a scale never before seen in history. Some of you may think this is only cruelty against animals dumb enough to eat. But would you eat your dog? Or cat? Or horse? Indians consider cows to be part of the family. We eat them. We consider dogs to be part of the family. Asians eat them. Most people say they're animal lovers, yet they eat farm animals three times a day. And yet farm animals are as feeling as any household pet, and in many cases, 
far more intelligent. How humans decide what animals they eat defies all logic because there's no difference between a slice of dog meat in Korea and a slice of bacon in Kansas. When we talk to animals or touch them, our blood pressure falls, and so does theirs. The animals we eat have come to trust humans for their care, and we violate that trust every time we make them into a meal. You can make this double standard disappear, improve your health and the environment as well by simply not eating them. Not only does eating animals cause degenerative diseases, but eating animals has also caused the major infectious diseases in our history, including smallpox, influenza, tuberculosis, malaria, plague, measles, and cholera. These diseases have emerged as a result of taking animals out of their natural habitats and putting them into unnatural settings where their diseases mutate and eventually infect humans. Primarily due to our increasing appetite for animals, 75% of all new infectious diseases discovered during the last 30 years have come from animals. The new strains of influenza and other diseases now coming out of Asia are the direct result of Asians changing to an animal-based diet. In an effort to stop these diseases, 70% of our antibiotic supply is not used on humans at all, but farm animals. And as bacteria become resistant to antibiotics used on farm animals, it makes them less effective on humans. In just two decades, penicillin has become only 18% as effective as it once was against common bacteria. In trying to prevent diseases in animals so we can eat them, we have made ourselves more vulnerable to the very diseases we are trying to prevent. As a result of eating animals, we not only kill ourselves with degenerative diseases, but we kill ourselves with infectious diseases that leap from the animals we eat to man. The biggest killer of humans in the history of life on this planet, in fact, turns out to be the human appetite for animals. We kill billions of wild animals to protect the animals we eat. We then destroy our environment to feed the animals we eat. We spend more time, money, and resources fattening the animals we eat than we do feeding humans who are actually starving. The greatest irony is that after all the expense of raising these animals, we eat them and they kill us. And instead of recognizing this insanity, we torture and kill millions of other animals trying to find a cure to the diseases caused by eating animals in the first place. When it comes to eating, humans are without question the dumbest animals on the planet. The typical American eats over 3,000 farm animals in a lifetime. Here is what Time Magazine has said about the health and environmental costs of our eating habit. Much as we have awakened to the full economic and social costs of cigarettes, we will find we can no longer subsidize or ignore the cost of mass producing cattle, poultry, pigs, sheep, and fish to feed our growing population. These costs include hugely inefficient use of fresh water and land, heavy pollution from livestock feces, rising rates of heart disease and other degenerative illnesses, and spreading destruction of our forests on which much of the planet's life depends.
According to some, humans are now consuming more natural resources than the Earth can sustain, and eating animal foods is one of the major reasons. We're currently locked in a vicious cycle of corporate greed that feeds off the political system, destroys American bodies, devastates the environment, and has turned our farms into something we should all be ashamed of. You now have an opportunity to do something great, not just for yourself, but for your children and generations to come. The simple act of changing your diet will not only give you a healthier and longer life, but will help reverse an eating habit that's destroying the very fabric of our lives. It all starts with one person. And if enough people change their diets, our modern eating habit can be transformed into something we can all be proud of that not only benefits our bodies, but the world we live in. Thank you for joining me today. Came the reason why I felt like I could love again. We kissed in the dark and you asked me for my heart. Now Just three words is all I'm asking. Just three words. But why do you cry? Just hold me tight and say I love you.
Just say I love you. Just 